supplements to me just feel like sure if they can help and it's great um but yeah you stop taking them and all of a sudden it comes back it's just like it's, right. it's not enough like because yeah. life is too dynamic you travel you do things you know work gets stressful whatever the case may be and sometimes supplements just feel a little too too fragile hey everyone this is dr ruscio today i spoke with jeff who is a patient at our office who came in with a predominant symptom of brain fog and his case study, as you'll hear um, from him in a moment, was a good example of how much of brain fog actually emanates from the gut. And this is something I personally learned. But in addition to that, there were a few other lines of support that we had to integrate into his case to really allow him to resolve his brain fog. And these were not brain supplements like lion's mane or uh, ginkgo, uh, what have you. Uh, they were actually to do with breathing and with his uh, fitness program as, as two fairly primary underlying factors that were needed to be addressed, in addition to actually making some dietary modifications in the opposite direction of low carb or keto, which you will often hear the, the neurological merits of the keto diet, which do exist, but it doesn't mean that everyone's going to do best on a ketogenic diet who's trying to optimize for their brain health. So a, a couple of really good examples of how stepwise personalized care can help resolve in this case, th this chronic non-responsive brain fog and how there was a few different things that underlied that. And by identifying those in a precision way and supporting those, we were able to see not only improvements in brain fog, but also sleep energy uh, and digestive symptoms in general. So, okay, we'll go to the conversation now with Jeff. Hey everyone, this is Dr. Ruscio. I am here today joined by Jeff, who has had some struggles similar to my own, mainly with brain fog, which Jeff, man, I, I feel your pain there. I know how much of a uh, challenge and a just a annoyance brain fog can be. And I wouldn't say we're fully out of the woods yet, but you're clearly much better uh, you know, now than when we started working together. And I wanted to take this opportunity to share with people how much of brain fog can be resolved by somewhat simple things, but, but I guess one of, the, one of the philosophical points your case illustrates is everyone can say, hey, you know, this diet or this thing is good for brain fog, but it may not be the case for you. And so I, I want to share, especially that, that dietary piece that we were just talking about before we started the recording. Uh, but I guess before we start going into some of the nitty gritty of what we did to help improve your situation, Give us the, the short snapshot of the symptoms that you were struggling with before we started working together. Sure. Um, so yeah, I started uh, struggling with a little bit of back pain initially, then went to my um, doctor. She pre prescribed some prednisone and I felt great for a few days. And then all of a sudden the floodgates opened mm -hmm. and I had really bad brain fog. Uh, I had tons of nausea, uh, really bad sinus problems. Um, and that just kind of continued on and on and on. And I started taking antibiotics and started like making <laughs> probably things a lot worse. And really like the, the main, main things being just like from the brain standpoint, like the sinus and the brain fog just got worse and worse and worse over the like, you know, coming weeks. Sure. And, and so one of the things when, when you hear sinus issues, congestion, running nose, what, what have you combined with brain fog is you're thinking some sort of histamine overload. Uh, and there's definitely elements of this in your case. Um, so the, the things that seem to have moved the needle the most and modify this at all, because I think you living through this, you're going to have the most precise understanding of this, um, but getting off of kind of a, a more strict low FODMAP diet and upping your carbs was one mouth taping was another, and this doesn't hit for everyone, but for, for those whom it does, it's clearly noticeable. Um, cardiovascular training, I think you were just going too hard on the weights and, and I have to credit uh, Dr. Mikey Nelson for bringing this to my attention on the podcast that some people just need to balance out their exercise stimulus um, and probiotics and maybe some antihistamine support. Um, but you know, those are maybe the main levers. Let's start with the dietary uh, one first, because I think this is where people will think, okay, maybe it's histamine, maybe it's SIBO, that can affect your brain, but there's certainly evidence showing this connection. And so people can kind of shoehorn themselves into, well, I got to do this diet because of XYZ. And you were saying before we started the recording, 
that was one of the initial things that you really noticed as you upped your carb intake that led to, you know, one jump in improvement, you know, 20-ish percent, let's say just, you know, roughly speaking. Um, but yeah, tell us a little bit more about that realization and, and maybe, you know, what, what was going on up here in terms of reading all this stuff saying, you got to do this to feel better. You're doing that. You're not feeling better. And how did you jump tracks to, you know, deviating from that? Yeah. I mean, so like when I realized it was a month in or so, and I just wasn't getting better. I went towards deep into like, well, what can I do with diet? So I did paleo autoimmune protocol. Um, that was really difficult, but it did help a little bit. Uh, then I eventually got on a low FODMAP diet and that helped a little bit as well, but I was on it for like probably two months, three months, and really just wasn't finding the, the benefits that I, that I thought I was going to get with it. And that's when I, I think we spoke about this last time we, we met, but you had a, one of these testimonials with somebody and you told them to start eating gluten um, in, in small doses to right. try to get like the car. And I was like, you can't do that. How, you can't say that. <laughs> Heresy. Yeah. Oh uh, Yeah. And so I was like, okay, that's really interesting. Like I, I, you know, I used to eat all that kind of stuff, but, um, and like more carbs and maybe I should just try going back to a little bit more broader paleo diet. And so I introduced rice and potatoes back into my diet and like almost within a week felt like you said, 20, 30% better. Like I just had more energy, a little bit more clarity in the, in the, like with, from the brain fog standpoint and immediately just like realized, okay, like maybe I was, whether it's under, under utilization of carbohydrates or just under calories, whatever that maybe probably a blend of those. Um, it really started to help me. And, and, and I think the biggest thing, and I, this is why I really like wanted to come to you. And I like your work is like, when I was in those diets, I was also in like the diet mindset, where it was like, you know, I, I, like it was so stressful if I had any sort of thing that might mm. be tempting the diet. Right. And I know that stress was added to it. So to like yeah. free up and say like, look, if you had gluten once, or if you just like increase your carbohydrates, it like kind of gave me that little bit of buffer that I think that mindset also helped a lot too. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a great point. People tend to, you know, build these dietary prisons around themselves that they oftentimes don't need to build. And, and uh, you know, that, that ability to go outside the box and discover is, is crucially important. It's not that easy. I mean, I get it. I, you know, 10 years or so ago, I was very apprehensive about anyone eating outside of a, of a paleo template, but then, you know, you have one case where you say, well, let's, let's just try this higher carb thing. And it goes well, and then you do it again and you do it enough times and you start seeing, well, here are some of the early indicators that someone may be on too low carb of a diet. Uh, and then, yeah, you, know, you see the benefit, like you said, um, yeah. let's talk about probiotics for a second. Cause that's something where I wish there was, there was a more responsible narrative online about this because you'll, you'll have people making the claim that because probiotics contain histamine, they're always going to be bad for anyone with histamine intolerance, unless you use the super special histamine free probiotic. And I think it's really making the, it, it's discounting the fact that probiotics tend to be net antihistamine, even if they contain histamine, the net effect tends to be antihistamine. Now, it's not to say that someone may have some reactivity to probiotics. It's fairly rare, but it can happen. And there was a little bit of that in your case, but as you started to improve, your tolerance for probiotics really opened up and then you saw this progressive benefit from the probiotics. Um, but anything on the, the probiotic piece that you want to make people aware of? Yeah, I mean, for, for me, I know there's like the, the three pillars, like the three stools for the, uh, for the probiotics. And I had a really hard time starting on any of them. Um, and so like when, I think when we first started meeting, I, you know, I tried one, I think there was a lacto first and like really struggled with it. And then over time, the more stuff we added on, yeah, it eventually got, uh, was able to take all three. There, there have been periods though, where I've stopped taking, like I was feeling bad taking them and I stopped taking them and then felt better. Um, so it does seem to be like a hit or miss thing for me, but overall, I can definitely say it has, add, like, like you mentioned, like a, from a net benefit, it has added more relief to my symptoms than anything else. Right. And I guess um, along those yeah. lines, you had noted that a supplement holiday, and I think you had come yeah. across one of our, our podcasts or, or something similar where we discussed this concept of sometimes it's helpful just to clear the deck, come off everything, because there might be one or two things in this array of stuff that you're taking that's actually uh, aggravating your problem. And you don't, the only way to figure that out is just to throw all stuff off the table, take some time off, let the system gestate. And in your chart notes, I have this, this great note that the supplement holiday was hugely helpful for you. And I think that's worth underscoring for people. Yeah. I mean, I, I tried so many restrictive diets but like every time I did a restrictive diet, I felt like I added supplements. 
And that just kind of occurred <laughs> to me. I was like, wait, I've never like restricted supplements. And so like, what if I just like stopped taking supplements for a week? Like what would happen? Right. Um, Cause I mean, I, you know, like 15 pills and you're just like, which one of these is working? I like, I have no idea. So right. to really try to sort of separate that out and then come back on it and say, well, which ones are actually contributing and being a little bit more scientific about it has been really helpful. Yeah. And that's, you know, again, why, why we go through this kind of slower and stepwise process. And just to acknowledge that I think for, for some patients, this can be challenging because they're saying, well, why aren't we supporting this? Why aren't we supporting that? Why aren't we supporting the other thing? And it's the same thing that clinicians go through. I think, especially younger clinicians, they don't want to potentially withhold any one thing of like the 15,000 things that could help someone. So they end up just giving a bunch of supplementation, but it doesn't allow you to pinpoint reactions and it doesn't allow you to know what's helping and what's not helping and knowing what's helping or what's causing a reaction. That's all diagnostic information that the clinician is losing out on. If you're, if you're kind of shotgunning it and just throwing a bunch of stuff at someone. So yeah, it's a great point. And, and uh, glad we have your case to give, you know, people watching and listening to this, another evidence point for why aggressive supplementation isn't the best approach. You know, it, it oftentimes lead to, uh, leads to wheel spinning and uh, suboptimal response. And I guess, uh, you know, another thing that to bring into this would be the breathing piece um, and the mouth taping. And this is such a great intervention for some people because it's cheap. I mean, you know, tape may cost you $7 for a roll that will last you an entire month. Um, but, it, you know, if someone during the night is breathing through their mouth, this is destruct I shouldn't say destructive. It's counterproductive for a number of reasons. It puts you into more of a sympathetic state. It thwarts the production of nitric oxide. Uh, the, the book Breath um, it really did a phenomenal job of, of outlining how important it is to breathe through your nose and not through your mouth. And they went through this experiment where he had his nose clogged so he can only, you know, with some sort of like medical tape or, or what have you could only breathe through his mouth for a week and his blood pressure spiked, his fatigue went way up, uh, his sleep regressed. And so presumably what was happening in your case is there was a degree of nocturnal mouth breathing and the, the tape over the mouth kind of re-encouraged you to nasal breathe. And on the user side of that, that was another one of those kind of 20-ish percentage point gain pieces. But um, yeah, you know, anything there that, that you think people should know about consider yeah it, it's not as scary as it sounds uh my <laughs> wife thought i was insane when i told her i was gonna try to start doing it um and uh, maybe a little hack for everybody is so they sell like those little strips you can put on they're specifically made for it i found those are really sh i struggled to keep those on at night um mostly because like i have a beard most days um and my my just might might have been a little too, too small for my mouth so i actually got some surgical tape that you, like you said you can buy for like four dollars on amazon um, and put that right over your mouth and it stays on like no problem. And it's really easy to take off in the morning. But yeah. I would say the, the biggest thing that I noticed is just like waking up refresh. Um, I also read that book at the, around the same time we were thinking about this. And I just noticed there's so many nights I'd wake up on my back with my mouth open. Mm. And I was curious, like how many hours <laughs> had I been, you know, just mouth breathing and just getting that like really difficult sleep and without that, without the good sleep to get like the brain refreshed and like uh, just all the symptoms I was having, it just right. made sense. Like, why not try this? Yep. Yep. And the other thing that was a little bit surprising to me in your case, in, in terms of the, the magnitude of positive impact it had was balancing out your exercise plan to include some low level cardio and the low level cardio, I think is sometimes unjustifiably malign, you know, th there are some who have the belief that, you know, the, the best thing for body composition is weight training, which that actually may be true. But I, I think what's left out of that is it's not all about optimizing solely for body composition and someone can drift into this imbalance. And this is something I remember Paul check um, speaking about years and years ago about this left ventricular hypertrophy, which can happen in some strength athletes if they're just doing lots of heavy lifting. And it leads to this imbalance hypertrophy of the chamber of the, of the hearts. Uh, and I thought maybe this was more speculative conjecture until Nelson came on the podcast and we had a conversation. And boy, this was, this was the first uh, patient uh, case study where making that change really led to, you know, a pretty notable improvement because you were you were quite jazzed about the the level of improvement. Uh, so yeah, tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, this was 
like in retrospect is like duh like why wouldn't I have thought this would like would contribute to <laughs> some of the problems I was having but yeah I spent better part of five to seven years just doing weight training um like that's all I did I thought cardio was a sin like you shouldn't do it right. um and so I avoided it and when I listened to this podcast and then was started thinking about when I do walk when I do go for a run like um what, what is my heart rate? And I noticed it was so high, like I was into zone three within like a minute of doing any of those kind of activities. Mm. And I just thought like this, one, this just can't overall be healthy, but two, I really wonder if from like a stress standpoint, from an ability to like adapt to stresses, um, I wonder if like my body's just kind of gotten weak in that area. Um, and so, yeah, I just started on, I didn't really do any specific protocol, but kind of started off, you know, more zone two training each week and then kept upping the number of minutes. Yeah. And just saw a significant benefit, one, from the standpoint of like a symptom, but also the ability to just do more work, whether it's mental work or like actual physical work, whether it's yeah. sports or, or working out. Yeah. And that's also one of the things that Nelson mentioned, which is, you know, if, if your baseline heart rate is elevated, it's going to make it much more difficult for you to do anything. It's like you're, you're, you're driving around one gear too low. And so <laughs> the engine's always kind yeah. of revved up a, a little bit too high, which is, I think, a great analogy to to connect. And then when we, when we build on top of that, the breathing at, at night and the carbs, you know, all these things are just going to be chronically stressing you out metabolically and, and resolving those is, is probably one of the, you know, um, under great underpinnings as to why the mental clarity got better, even though it wasn't like, Hey, here's the hot nootropic supplement, take this. And it helps with, you know, BDNF and, and, um, all these other things. That's interesting, um, but these are really the, the pillars and why we harp so much on you've got to get these pillars in place because those are what really give you the, the movement of the needle to a significant degree. And, and you know the end phase, um, sprinkle on top, cherry on top, if you will, maybe experimenting with things like lion's mane or what have you. But for most people, that's, that's not going to be the root underlying cause of their brain fog. They, they also just feel most, more robust. Like supplements to me just feel like, sure, if they can help and it's great, um, but yeah, you stop taking them and all of a sudden it comes back. It's just like, it's, right. it's not enough. Like, cause yeah. life is too dynamic. You travel, you do things, you know, work gets stressful, whatever the case may be. And sometimes supplements just feel a little too, too fragile. Sure. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a partial dependency, which we don't want. We want you yeah. to be, like you said, as robust and as resilient as you can be. Now there is yeah. one, one wrinkle here. Uh, I want to kind of close this out on because I think this this articulates to people that healing is is oftentimes not this super short journey. Now that being said, I strongly disagree with the well. This is going to be like a three year process, and there's all these layers because that's just like okay, you're you're not holding yourself as a clinician to a high enough standard if you think something's going to take three years to resolve. Um, now on the other end, three weeks probably too unrealistic of an expectation. Uh, but in your case, you know, over a few months, we've seen fairly remarkable improvements, but there's still something going on with the histamine. And when your seasonal allergies recently kicked up, you, you were brought down a level and understandably so that made you concerned. And, you know, I totally feel that concern. What, what's reassuring about that is if the only thing that changed was this seasonal allergies hit, then that tells us, okay, this is an environmental thing that we know is A, going to be temporary, B, we know what the cause is, and C, with some supplementation and or further healing, that's the other thing I should mention, is, is as your system becomes more robust over time, your histamine load is likely going to be greatly diminished. So even if we did nothing else over time, the brain fog impact of seasonal allergies will likely attenuate. Um, but we're, we're just getting you going now. And I don't think it's early enough for you to be able to kind of report back. And I think you just received everything. Um, but with a kind of higher dose of some of the natural antihistamines. Uh, so, you know, that's the next thing that we're working on just to illustrate for people you know, oftentimes there's iterations that, you know, we had to go through, you know, diet, lifestyle, supplemental, and we're making progress all the way. And even though we're, I think in a, in a good spot right now, there's still a couple final things that we're trying to sort out just to, again, articulate to people that a three week turnaround would be unrealistic. Three years is also ridiculous. We don't need to wait that long. Um, but yeah, anything, anything there that you want to share with people? Yeah. I mean, I found in this journey, the, like to your point about the more diagnostics as, as a clinician you can get from me the better you can help me 
And I think there's a lot of times early on where I would find a level of like, it wasn't hundred percent, but it was like 80% and I would stay there. So I wouldn't test the foods. I wouldn't test, you know, new things, or I just kind of want to stay at this level. And I think each time, especially with you, where I've kind of gone backwards in something, we've gone at least four step forwards. And yeah. so like yeah. for, for anybody like nervous about, you know, when you get the, the, the you go backwards of a few steps, um, the ability to then use that as a diagnostic, you know, in, input to then be able to go farther, go, you know, go faster with this healing process, I think is always going to be a beneficial thing. So I've definitely gone from freaking out to like, all right, I know this is like, there's only a few handful of things left. This could possibly start, you know, so it's, it's through, through time, it becomes a lot easier. So, yeah. Great. Well said, well said. Well, yeah, Jeff, this has been great. Um, anytime I can help someone not have brain fog, like I did, that, that's a huge <laughs> win. Um, anything you want to kind of leave people with in close? Um, the, yeah, the number one thing is like, you will get better. I can say I, I sat in many, uh, online forums that were full of sick people <laughs> oh boy. And, and, and didn't make you feel good. And so if you can find your way out of those and find like this, like, I think the simplified path that you give people, Dr. Ruscio, in terms of from, from your book and the, and the supplements, and obviously this podcast as well, I think it's like this more simplified, you can make it the easier. It's going to be for yourself and it doesn't have to be so rigid and, and scary sometimes. So yeah, it gets yeah. better. Well, all, all really sage points, Jeff, and, and, uh, you know, thank you for being diligent and, and being okay with kind of, you know, the, I don't want to say slow road, but the more methodical road and, and not falling to the ploy of, you know, the lab companies or the gurus who promise you that, you know, your brain fog is because of this really cool exotic new mechanism. And if we can just pinpoint that with $4,000 worth of labs, then we can, you know, we can uh, uh, resolve the treatment because, you know, part of what allows doctors to stay in business is, is patients who are supporting different care models. And so I think the more patients who are going to be savvy and not get pulled into some of these specious arguments and promises, uh, that's actually better for the field. It's kind of like people supporting, you know, big processed food companies or shopping locally, right? You know, where your, where your um, dollars go, you'll, you'll foster a marketplace or you'll cause one to dwindle. So a thanks back to you just for having the, uh, the, the clarity to make it, you know, I'm going to pat myself on the back a little bit here, but, you know, make a good decision in terms of who you worked with. Um, and also just thank you so much for, for the willingness to share your story. And I'm so glad that you're at, at this kind of this 90%. We've got a few more things to tweak and we'll keep at it. And I, I think we're, we're just on the doorstep or we're going to get over the threshold if we just give your body a little bit more time, which again, I think is really uh, important to reiterate for people. Uh, so yeah, Jeff, it's been a pleasure working with you. You've been awesome. And thank you again so much for, for sharing your story. Thank you. 